So a few years ago, our youngest, Jude, uh, he was just about two years old. And at this time, he was kind of getting into that terrible two stage where he was wanting to be independent, wanting to do things himself, but also just complete ball of chaos. And one day we had some time to kill on a Saturday and, and Nicole decided like, hey, we need to run by Hobby Lobby and pick up something. So let's just go as a family. And, and we pull up to the Hobby Lobby parking lot. I crack open the back of our minivan and grab out the stroller to put Jude in the stroller. And, and he, as I pick him up to put him in the stroller, he like kicks and screams like a full on tantrum. No, I walk, I'm a big boy, I walk. He, he refused to get into the stroller because he wanted to walk and be a big boy. And so I squatted down and I looked him right in the eye and I said, Jude, okay, I'll let you walk. But if you touch anything, you're going back in the stroller. You got it? Okay. I got it, I walk, I'm a big boy. And so in we walk into the store, Nicole and our two oldest up front, Jude right behind them, and I, I kind of walked in the back to keep my eyes on that boy. And I don't know what it is with Hobby Lobby in the front of their store being just an island after island of breakable knickknacks. It was like a minefield we had to navigate. But the entire time we were walking through Hobby Lobby with all of these items that, that Jude could easily destroy, my boy, I kid you not, the entire 20 minutes we were there, he walked like this tiptoeing around with his hands extended and he just kept saying this under his breath, breakable, breakable, breakable. Like he was terrified of breaking something because he wanted to show to us that he could avoid the temptation, not touch and break anything and walk like a big boy. I think the truth is we, like this, this two-year-old, we all want to be a little bit more independent and yet we battle temptation every single day. Uh, we know we serve this holy God and yet as we battle temptation, we know we're supposed to live holy and not make a mess of breaking everything in our lives. And so the question is, how can we, how can we live the way that God has called us to live in a world that's so surrounding us with temptation? So here in John chapter 10, some religious leaders, they kind of corner Jesus and they, they basically say to him like, relieve the tension, make it clear. Are you the Christ or not? And Jesus responds with, look, I've already made it clear. And he goes on to say, I and the Father are one. And it's that statement that causes them to pick up rocks and prepare to stone him. And Jesus then kind of outwits them and slips away. Now, all of this happens in Jerusalem at another feast. The gospel writer John is really highlighting these feasts to show us that Jesus is, in fact, the Jewish Messiah. But this particular feast called the Feast of Dedication is what we would call Hanukkah today. And to really catch the claim that Jesus is making here to these religious leaders, you and I, we need to understand something about Hanukkah. So here's a quick overview in a nutshell of the story of Hanukkah. In the time in between our Old and New Testament, about 150 years before Jesus' birth, uh, there was at the end of the Greek Empire, as Alexander the Great falls, there was a, a Syrian king, a, a ruler known as Antiochus Epiphanes. He came and he ruled over Israel for a season before Rome became established. And Antiochus decided it would be a good idea to set up a pagan shrine, a pagan altar in the middle of the temple. And he then sacrificed a pig, an unclean animal, on that pagan altar within the temple in Jerusalem. Now this doesn't just insult the Jews. Uh, this isn't just a, a defilement of the temple, but this made the temple a place where Israel cannot worship God because it is no longer sacred. And, and so a man named Judas Maccabeus, yeah, he was a, a son of a priest. He rose up and started what was known as the Maccabean Revolt, a, a, a war retaliating against this empire. And it would be several years of guerrilla warfare that allowed this ragtag bunch of outsiders known as Israel to overcome this great conquering kingdom. And then it would take seven days for them to make the temple holy and sacred and purified again. And it's that, that seven day period where they're waiting for the temple to be made holy again to worship in, uh, that we get the, the idea of lighting of the menorah. Uh, they found within the temple only one vessel of oil remaining that hadn't been defiled by Antiochus and his men. And, and so they lit that knowing that it was only a one day supply. And it lasted eight days uh, until that entire time of ritually purifying the temple again could be made right. It was miraculously sustained and the, the menorah remained lit within the temple. And to this day, they'll light a menorah, they'll light a lampstand every day for eight days to celebrate God's provision and the rededication of the temple for worship in Israel. Now I want you to picture something with me for a moment. Jesus is standing in Jerusalem where that temple stands and he's saying to religious leaders who are asking him if he's the coming Christ, the coming Messiah, who's gonna liberate them from this other oppressive kingdom known as Rome. 
He, he says to them, I have been sent into this world consecrated by the Father. In fact, Jesus says this specifically in verse 36. Do you say of him, referring to himself, do you say of him who the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you were blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? Now that word consecrated is another way of saying holy, uh, set apart, uh, sent here on mission for a specific purpose, but, but different than the rest of the world. It's been consecrated or made Holy. Jesus is saying, I have come into the world set apart as holy. He's essentially saying, just like the temple was rededicated, re-consecrated, set apart as holy for worship to God, I have been sent into the world to become the new temple. I am the one who is holy. I am the one, the realization and the truth that this entire temple system points to. I am the holy one. And the good news for you and me who believe in Jesus, is that we don't have to go into a temple and make a sacrifice any longer because he was the fulfillment of that entire system. He died as the sacrifice for our sins. He died to atone for our sins. No longer does the high priest have to go into the most holy place once a year within the temple to make a sacrifice for all of us. So what Jesus is claiming is to be the Holy One. And the good news for you and me is that he then makes us holy. But I think we live our lives much like the the two-year-old version of my, my son in Hobby Lobby. We're walking around all of the different places of temptation in this world, knowing that we're set apart as holy by Jesus and living in a real world full of sin and struggle and brokenness and temptation. This week, I, I happen to be on a, a trip with a few friends here in Southern California, and I'm standing right in front of the Hollywood sign. And while there's nothing particularly evil about this place, the entertainment industry stands for us as all kinds of versions of temptation in our lives. Temptations for, for envy, for greed, for lust, for all kinds of things that can creep into our lives. It's an amazing opportunity for us to stand here and talk about this idea of holiness because we're called to be holy. In fact, in 1 Peter 1, 16, it says, you shall be holy for I am holy. Uh, we know as believers, we're supposed to be set apart. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to live holy lives. And even though we're sinful and broken and we make mistakes and, and and this side of eternity, we're not gonna reach perfection. We know deep down we're supposed to be growing into the likeness of Christ. We're supposed to be holy because He is holy. So how do you and I navigate this world in light of the holiness of God that He has given to us? First of all, I think it comes by understanding that we ourselves aren't just becoming holy. We don't just work really hard to muster enough confidence to live a perfect life. You and I are holy because Jesus came and made us holy with his death and resurrection. When he says that he is the one consecrated by the Father and sent into this world to go to the cross on our behalf, it means that he died to make us holy. We are holy because he is holy. We're not just becoming holy. We are holy. Our sins have been forgiven. And yet we still live in this fallen, broken world and need to take steps to be more and more like Christ and grow into his likeness. I think a great way that we can learn to navigate all of the temptation we face in this world is to read Matthew chapter 4. In fact, what I challenged our launch team with just a little over a week ago was to read Matthew chapter 4 uh, throughout the week several times. It's an amazing text that shows us, first of all, that Jesus himself was tempted. He was tempted. He faces the same struggle that you and I face in his time here on earth. He, in his flesh, was tempted, and yet even though he, he did not sin, he showed that he is like us. He understands our brokenness. He understands what we face and he didn't fall into sin. And as we read Matthew chapter four, we realize some amazing things. First of all, that boy knows some scripture. Jesus had scripture memorized to quote back at the enemy who came to tempt him. We need to also realize that there's always a way out. Jesus was actively searching for the way out of temptation. But what we have to know is that when we're tempted that way out, it could be the use of scripture and being led by the Holy Spirit. So my challenge to you is to read Matthew chapter four this week and start to learn and take scripture seriously. One of my favorite verses that I learned in an accountability group in high school is 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which I've kind of quoted in a paraphrased way already. It says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He'll not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he'll also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. That verse has been for me the way out so many times, a, a way to stand up under it. No, I've fallen and I've sinned and I've made mistakes in my life. That verse has gotten me out of more sin. 
and has allowed me to step into a way that I can try to grow more and more in the likeness of Christ. I think it could be that for you as well. I think actually what we need to do is we need to realize that temptation is itself not sin. We need to begin to change our perspective and realize the opportunity that temptation presents us. Or as the commentator William Barclay puts it, here then is one of the great and precious truths about temptation. Temptation is not designed to make us fall. Temptation is designed to make us stronger and better men and women. Temptation is not designed to make us sinners. It is designed to make us good. We may fail in the test, but we were not meant to. We were meant to emerge stronger and finer. In one sense, temptation is not so much the penalty of being man. It is the glory of being a man. If metal is to be used in a great engineering project, it is tested at stresses and strains far beyond those which it is ever likely to have to bear. So a man has to be tested before God can use him greatly in his service. You know, it shouldn't come as any surprise in you as you read Matthew chapter four this week that the first thing that Jesus does before his ministry begins is be tempted. It was right after his baptism when the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove that that spirit led him out into the desert and then the enemy appeared to tempt him. If God is gonna use us greatly, we're going to go through temptation. And I believe it's an opportunity for you and I to shift our perspective and realize we're not doomed to fail when we face temptation. We have the opportunity when we face temptation to be holy as He is holy so that He can use us greatly for His service. The question is, are we willing to fight the good fight and live on mission for Him 